Have. They've got evidence. They're going to present it to the board. You have to do something. Don't worry, Genevieve. I'll handle it. Just stay calm and follow my lead. Herb, you really shouldn't have answered her call. When you're with me, I expect your full attention. I may not be your wife, but I deserve some respect. I turn off my phone for you, so why can't you do the same for me? I understand where you're coming from, Vicky, but you know I'm a businessman. I have to stay connected, especially with my women who work at ACLAT Consultants. They're my eyes and ears there. They keep me informed. My finances are in a mess, and my other businesses are struggling. ACLAT Consultants is my lifeline right now, and as a founding member and group CFO, I can't afford to miss anything. The last time we talked about your financial troubles, you mentioned soul ties. Do you think your problems could be linked to your relationships? Are you suffering because you're involved with so many women, or has your wife cursed you and every woman who gets involved with you? I don't know what to think. I choose not to believe in soul ties. If they're real, then I'm probably tied to countless women. Remember, the Bible says, the two shall become one. 1 Corinthians 6 15 to 19 KJV says, Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ, and make them the members of an harlot? God forbid. What? Know ye not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body? For two, saith he, shall be one flesh. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? I found an interesting sermon online about soul ties. I thought we could watch it together before we reach our destination. Sermon, Breaking Free from Soul Ties Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, today we delve into a critical and often misunderstood topic, soul ties. We must understand what soul ties are, how they entangle us, and how we can break free from their bondage through the power of Jesus Christ. What are soul ties? Soul ties are deep emotional and spiritual bonds formed between individuals. These ties can be godly or ungodly. In the context of marriage, the Bible speaks of godly soul ties, the two shall become one flesh, Genesis 2.24. However, when we engage in fornication or adultery, we create ungodly soul ties, which can have devastating spiritual consequences. How people get entangled. When we commit sexual sin, we not only bond with the person with whom we sin but also with all the individuals that person has had similar connections. This creates a complex web of soul ties. The Bible warns us in 1 Corinthians 6 16, do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? For it is said, the two will become one flesh. The supporting scripture can be found in 1 Corinthians 6 15 to 18. 1 Corinthians 6 15 to 18 KJV says, Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ, and make them the members of an harlot? God forbid. What? Know ye not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body? For two, saith he, shall be one flesh. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. Symptoms of ungodly soul ties. Ungodly soul ties can manifest in various troubling ways. 1. Sudden negative behaviors. You may find yourself stealing, lusting, or engaging in behaviors that were never part of your character before. 2. Spiritual confusion and bondage, a sense of being spiritually bound or oppressed, feeling distant from God, and experiencing confusion in your faith. 3. Emotional instability, unexplainable emotional swings, depression, and anxiety can be signs of these ties. 4. Recurrent sin, 
struggling with recurring sin despite your desire to live righteously. The web of soul ties. The complexity of soul ties extends beyond the immediate relationship. When you engage in fornication or adultery, you inherit all the spiritual baggage, evil spirits, habits, and weaknesses of the other person. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 6:18, flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually, sins against their own body. Breaking free from soul ties. To break free from these chains, follow these steps. 1. Seek forgiveness. Confess your sins to the Lord and seek his forgiveness. 1 John 1, 9 reassures us, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. 2. Repent. Turn away from the sin and commit to living a life that honors God. Acts 3.19 urges us, repent, then, and turn to God, so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. 3. Deliverance in Jesus' name. Pray for deliverance in the mighty name of Jesus. Luke 10.19 says, I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions, and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. 4. Fasting and prayer. Regularly engage in fasting and prayer. The Lord Jesus Christ taught in Matthew 17 21, but this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. 5. Meditate on scripture. Fill your mind and heart with God's word. Psalm 119, 11 says, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Additional scriptures to meditate on, 2 Timothy 4.18 says, The Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. James 4.7 says, Submit yourselves, then, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. 1 John 4, 4 says, You, dear children, are from God and have overcome him, because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. Mark 9.23 says, If you can, said Jesus, everything is possible for one who believes. And Psalm 91, 14-15 says, Because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him, I will protect him, for he acknowledges my name. He will call on me, and I will answer him, I will be with him in trouble, I will deliver him and honor him. The enemy's strategy. The devil uses soul ties to destroy destinies, cause people to sin, and create portals for demonic spirits. But Jesus came to set us free. John 8.36 declares, So if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. <laughs> Signs of freedom. Often you can know you are free from soul ties when you experience peace and a sense of spiritual freedom. You no longer struggle with the previous sinful behaviors. You feel the presence of God more strongly in your life. <laughs> Closing prayer, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you in the mighty name of Jesus. We acknowledge our sins and seek your forgiveness. Lord, we repent and turn away from all ungodly soul ties. We ask for deliverance from every bond that is not of you. Break every chain, every connection that the enemy has used to bind us. We stand on your word, believing in your power to set us free. Fill us with your Holy Spirit, grant us peace, and guide us in your truth. We thank you, Lord, for your mercy and grace. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Conclusion Brothers and sisters, remember that freedom in Christ is not just a promise but a reality we can live in. Let us continually seek him, trust in his deliverance, and walk in the newness of life he provides. God bless you all. That's enough. Vicky, are you seriously suggesting that a man of my status has sold ties with street women? Absolutely not. Just because you don't believe in something doesn't mean it doesn't exist. 
I asked you a simple question, Hervé, what is the cause of your financial turmoil? You ask too many questions but don't offer solutions. You act smart, but if you were really smart, you wouldn't depend on men to take care of you and your children. Enough, Herve. If you gave me a monthly allowance, I wouldn't have to rely on other men for support. You know how hard it is to find a good job. Can we just enjoy the rest of our vacation? I'm sorry, Vicky, but we need to cut this vacation short. I have to go to Montserrat urgently. Maybe she's right about these soul ties. I'm terrified that I'm losing my wealth, and like Genevieve, I'm drowning in debt. The board members sit around the table, looking tense. Fernando stands at the head of the table, presenting the evidence. This is what we found. Detailed plans to ruin Antoinette's life, pictures of her house, newspaper clippings of her family. This is clear evidence that Genevieve has been plotting against her. This is all fabricated. Someone planted this evidence to frame me. I would never do something so vile. My enemies are at work. The board members exchange uncertain glances. Herve stands up, his expression calm and authoritative. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a serious accusation. However, we must consider the possibility that this evidence was planted. Genevieve has been under immense stress due to these rumors. I suggest we allow her to take a leave of absence on medical grounds while we conduct a thorough investigation. The board members murmur in agreement. Fernando clenches his fists in frustration but nods reluctantly. That seems reasonable. We need to ensure a fair process. Very well. Genevieve, you'll take a leave of absence while we investigate. Thank you. I appreciate your understanding. I knew you'd come through for me. This isn't over, Genevieve. You need to lay low and let me handle things. If this blows up, it could take us both down. I understand. Thank you, Herve. A few days later. What now, Fernando? We have all this evidence, but they're not taking it seriously. Herve's managed to make it disappear. He's got the board focusing on other things, like opening new offices abroad. We need to find another way. What? Herve, my love, thank you for everything. You've rescued me from a tough situation once again. We're in the clear for now, but you need to be careful. The pressure's on. Stay out of sight and don't do anything reckless. Don't worry, I know how to play the game. <laughs> Lord, give us strength. Help us find justice and protect us from those who wish us harm. We can't let this go. We need to keep digging, find something undeniable. Agreed, we'll find a way to bring her down. She can't hide forever. Pastor Martha Francois, welcome to my humble abode. Thank you, Beatrice. What a lovely home and a delightful morning. Yes, please come in. Helen is already here. The room is warm and inviting, a stark contrast to the turmoil in Beatrice's heart. Beatrice sits nervously on the couch, wringing her hands. Helene and Pastor Mrs. Martha Francois sit across from her, their expressions calm but serious. Thank you both for coming. I've been thinking a lot about what we've been discussing in our Bible study sessions, and I've come up with an idea that I think might work. We're here to listen, Beatrice. What's on your mind? I want to accept the Lord fully. I really do, but I can't just shut down the Shabim. It's my only source of income right now. I was thinking, maybe I could continue running the Shabin while I start building a new business. Once the new business takes off, I can shut down the Shabin for good. Helene looks concerned, glancing at Pastor Martha Francois, who remains calm but firm. Beatrice, I understand your concerns. But you can't have one foot in Christianity and another in evil works. 
You can't continue with a business that was motivated by evil, a business where men are entertained and loose women are hired to lure them into shameful acts. Mom, you've come so far. The Lord has already started working in our lives. We need to trust him fully. But what about our livelihood? How will we survive without the income from the Shabin? Beatrice, you must choose this day whom you will serve. The love of money is the root of all evil. You can't serve both God and money. If you're truly ready to accept the Lord, you need to let go of the Shabin and trust that he will provide for you in other ways. Beatrice's eyes fill with tears, her hands trembling. She looks at her lean, who nods encouragingly. If that's the case, then I'm not ready. I can't fully accept Christianity if it means losing everything we have. That's your choice, Beatrice, but it's at your own peril. Tomorrow is not guaranteed to anyone. If something were to happen to you today, you would die unsaved. Is that a risk you're willing to take? Beatrice's face is a mix of fear and indecision. Helene reaches out and takes her mother's hand. Mom, please, I can help you to start afresh. The Lord will help us. We just have to believe. Beatrice, the Lord loves you and wants the best for you. But you have to be willing to take that step of faith. It's not easy, but it's the only way to true freedom and salvation. I, I need some time to think. Take the time you need, Beatrice. But remember, the Lord is waiting for you. Don't wait too long to make your decision. I'll be here with you, Mom. We'll get through this together. I will continue to pray for you. Thank you, Pastor. The mansion is grand and elegantly decorated. John Jacques, the ambassador, is hosting his daughters, Adele and Elise, for their first visit. They are seated in the spacious living room along with Charlotte, John Jacques' current wife. The girls look uncomfortable, exchanging glances. So, how do you like the place, girls? It's been a while since we've all been together. It's beautiful, Dad, really. Yeah, it's great. Charlotte notices their unease and Leanne's and gently. Is everything all right, girls? You seem a bit tense. We need to tell you something, Dad. Something about Mom. What is it, Adele? You know you can tell me anything. Mum's been, well, she's not what she pretends to be. She's been showing off her wealth, but it's all a facade. Hey, quickly, she's in huge debt because of all the properties she bought. She's struggling to pay off the home loans, and there are constant issues with tenants. And it's not just the financial problems. She slept her way to the top. She always has different men coming in and out of the house. We dread visiting her during breaks and holidays. John Jacques' face darkens with anger as he processes the revelations. I can't believe this. Your mother's behavior is putting you in danger. What if one of these men hurts you? This is unacceptable. What is wrong with Genevieve? It's not safe for you girls to be in that environment. We need to find a solution. Please don't tell mom we told you. She'll retaliate and make things even worse for us. We just want to be safe and away from all that drama. That's why we prefer visiting you, Dad. Don't worry, girls. I won't let you go back to that. We'll figure something out. Charlotte places a comforting hand on John Jacques' arm. What if they move into the family property whenever they're in the home country? The large house is empty except for the security personnel. At least, the kids can live in peace there. That's a brilliant idea. I'll support you financially. The interest earned from my investments should be enough to cover your monthly living expenses. That sounds perfect, Dad. We can't wait to share the good news with our brothers. Thank you so much. We'll finally have a safe place to stay. Golf tournament preparations. Maribel's office. Aklad consultants. Mom Tourette. 
The guest list is almost finalized. Just a few more confirmations to go. Maribel furrows her brow, crossing off names and jotting down notes. Elite CEOs, decision makers, every detail matters. She picks up the phone, dialing a number with practiced efficiency. Hello, this is Maribel from ACLA Consultants. I'm calling to invite Mr. Jonathan Williams to our upcoming golf tournament and corporate function. Meanwhile, Genevieve walks briskly past Mirabel's office, casting a quick, calculating glance inside before continuing on her way. She enters her own office nearby, a smirk playing on her lips. This event is crucial. I need to make sure everything goes flawlessly. Genevieve picks up her phone, making calls to subtly influence certain aspects of the event planning, ensuring Mirabel is kept on her toes. Hello? Yes. This is Genevieve from ACLAT Consultants. I just wanted to confirm our arrangements for the golf tournament. Oh, and please make sure the marquee for the evening awards ceremony is top-notch. Fernando and other directors from our head office will be there, after all. Back in Mirabel's office, the reception area, she hangs up the phone, leaning back in her chair with a weary sigh. She rubs her temples, feeling the weight of the responsibilities on her shoulders. Lord, give me strength. This event is important, not just for the company but for all the guests attending. Help me to manage everything with grace and excellence. In your precious name, I pray. Amen. Office of ACLA Consultants, Montserrat, close to event day. The office buzzes with last-minute preparations for the upcoming golf tournament and corporate function. Morable sits at her desk, surrounded by stacks of papers and a litany of tasks to complete. She bows her head in a moment of silent prayer. Lord, grant me your grace to handle everything and prosper in all I do. In Jesus' name I pray. As the weeks draw closer to the event, Genevieve becomes increasingly demanding and critical, piling on unnecessary pressure. Mirabel, we need to ensure every detail is perfect. Call hundreds of people daily to confirm their attendance. It's crucial for the event's success. Mirabel nods, her expression tense with the weight of the task. Genevieve, I've been managing everything alone. I have other urgent commitments too. Can someone else assist with the calls? No. Mirabel, this is your responsibility. You need to handle it all. We can't afford any mistakes. Frustration boils over, and Mirabel stands her ground, her voice firm with resolve. Enough, Genevieve. I can't do this alone anymore. Either someone else helps with the calls, or I won't be able to continue. Genevieve's face darkens with anger, her pride wounded by Mirabel's defiance. You will do as you're told, Mirabel. This event needs to be perfect. Later, Antoinette, observing the escalating tension, approaches Mirabel with concern. Mirabel, I've noticed you're managing everything yourself. At head office, there's usually a large team for such events. It's unfair to expect you to handle it all alone. Mirabel's eyes fill with tears of frustration and exhaustion. She turns away briefly, composing herself before responding. It's overwhelming, Antoinette. I can't sleep, barely eat. I feel like I'm drowning in all these responsibilities. Let me know if I can help you in any way. I will help out whenever I can. Thank you, Antoinette, however. I think I need to prioritize my sanity and well-being. I'm going to see a doctor. Yes. Mirabel's doctor's office, two days before the event. The doctor's office is calm, a stark contrast to the chaos Mirabel has been facing at work. She sits in the examination room, her face drawn with exhaustion, as the doctor reviews her medical records. Mirabel, your blood pressure is elevated, and you're showing signs of extreme stress. Have you been under a lot of pressure recently? Yes, doctor. I've been managing a major corporate event single-handedly, on top of my regular duties. The stress has been overwhelming. Mirabel, I'm going to recommend that you take three days off to rest and recover. It's important to prioritize your health right now. Thank you, doctor. I think that's exactly what I need. She accepts the prescription and leaves the doctor's office, 
feeling a mix of relief and guilt for needing to step away. I have to take care of myself. The team will have to manage without me for these few days. Are we heading back to the office, or should I take you home, Miss Mirabel? I'll stop by the office to drop off my sick leave letter before heading home. Today, I'm especially grateful that Fernando ensures all junior staff can use the company driver and car, and we get free meals. It really helps us save money. Yes, Mom, and it also provides me with a stable job and steady income. A glad consultants, two days before the corporate event. Genevieve sits at her desk, scrolling through emails and making notes for the upcoming corporate event. Her expression is tense, reflecting the mounting pressure of the impending responsibility. This event needs to be flawless. Fernando's impression of me and our branch depends on it. Come in. Just then, Mirabel enters Genevieve's office with a determined but fatigued expression. She carries a sealed envelope and a folder filled with detailed notes. Genevieve, I've brought my sick leave letter and the event details. I'll be taking the next three days to recover. Here's the doctor's letter. What? Sick leave? But Mirabel, the event is, it's in two days. I've outlined everything you'll need to know and do. The guest list, logistics, vendor contacts, it's all there. I'll be available by phone, but only during my lunch hour, if you need any assistance. Genevieve takes the letter and folder, her demeanor shifting from surprise to a reluctant acknowledgement of Mirabel's indispensable role. Mirabel, I, I didn't realize how much you've been handling. This is, a lot. It's been challenging, but I believe in the team. We can pull this off. Genevieve nods slowly, her mind racing with a sudden weight of responsibility that has fallen on her shoulders. Maybe, maybe I've underestimated Mirabel. I took her for granted. This is a disaster. What am I going to do? Genevieve stares at the documents in her hands, realizing the true extent of Mirabel's value to the company and the upcoming event. What am I going to do now? My career and image depends on the success of the event. Now, the person who was organizing the event single-handedly has pulled out last minute, and I can't force her to work when her doctor has confirmed that she's not well. I am now in a very difficult situation. In the intricate web of deceit and ambition, Genevieve's master plan initially seems foolproof as she deftly maneuvers to escape blame. She casts doubt on the damning evidence of her plotting against Antoinette, which included detailed plans and incriminating photos, by claiming it was all fabricated. This maneuver forces her to take leave on medical grounds due to alleged mental health issues caused by stress and rumors. Her lover, Perv, then steps in to make the evidence disappear, persuading Fernando and other directors to focus on strategic growth rather than managerial scandals. This clever diversion helps Genevieve maintain her precarious position within the company. However, Perv's personal life is crumbling under the weight of his own indiscretions and debts, exacerbated by soul ties with numerous women, including Genevieve. During a retreat with his girlfriend Vicky, Perv is confronted with the harsh reality of his spiritual entanglements through a powerful sermon by Pastor Martha Francois. The sermon delves into the dangers of soul ties formed through fornication and adultery, supported by scripture, explaining how these connections can invite destructive spirits and behaviors into one's life. The sermon emphasizes the necessity of seeking forgiveness, repenting, and undergoing deliverance to break free from these bonds. Beatrice's journey towards Christianity is similarly fraught with conflict. Encouraged by her daughter Helene's transformation, Beatrice is hopeful but hesitant to abandon her shipping business, fearing financial instability. Pastor Martha Francois, in an act of tough love, insists that Beatrice cannot straddle the line between righteousness and sinful enterprise. This ultimatum leaves Beatrice with a significant decision about her future and spiritual path. Meanwhile, Genevieve's daughters, Adele and Elise, expose the hollow facade of their mother's wealth and success during a visit to their father, John Jacques. The revelations of Genevieve's promiscuity, financial struggles, and abusive behavior prompt John Jacques to consider relocating his children to a safer environment, away from their mother's toxic influence. As the story unfolds, 
Mirabelle, under immense pressure from Genevieve to organize a critical corporate event, finds herself overwhelmed and unappreciated. Her health deteriorates, leading her to take sick leave just before the event. Genevieve's panic at losing her competent assistant highlights Mirabelle's invaluable role, underscoring the consequences of undervaluing dedicated employees. In the end, these intertwined stories underscore profound lessons. Ambition unchecked by ethics leads to ruin, spiritual bonds have significant consequences, and true success is rooted in integrity and respect for others. Through their struggles and transformations, the characters illustrate the importance of seeking divine guidance, repentance, and deliverance, reminding us that faith and perseverance pave the way for genuine redemption and peace. Before we conclude, we would like to share the following verses with you. Please note that they are taken from the King James Version of the Holy Bible. Ambition and Deceit Proverbs 11, 3 says, The integrity of the upright shall guide them, but the perverseness of transgressors shall destroy them. James 3.16 says, For where envying and strife is, there is confusion in every evil work. Proverbs 28, 6 says, Better is the poor that walketh in his uprightness, than he that is perverse in his ways, though he be rich. Soul Ties and Spiritual Entanglement 1 Corinthians 6.16-18 6, says, What? Know ye not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body? For two, saith he, shall be one flesh. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. If a science 5, 3 says, But fornication, and all uncleanness, or covetousness, let him not be once named among you, as becometh saints. 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 to 4 says, For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. Repentance and deliverance. Acts 3.19 says, Repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Psalm 51, 10 says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Integrity and Faithfulness Proverbs 12.22 says, Lying lips are abomination to the Lord, but they that deal truly are his delight. Luke 16.10 says, He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much, and he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. 1 Corinthians 4.2 says, Moreover it is required in stewards, that a man be found faithful. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you with humble hearts, seeking your divine guidance and mercy. We acknowledge our imperfections and the many ways we have strayed from your path. We ask for your forgiveness for our sins and the strength to turn away from all forms of deceit, ambition that leads us astray, and spiritual entanglements that bind us. Lord, your word reminds us in 1 John 1, 9 that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We cling to this promise, asking that you wash us clean and renew our spirits. We lift up to you all who are struggling with soul ties and spiritual entanglements. We ask for deliverance, as your word says in John 8:36, If the Son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. Break every chain that binds us, Lord, and release us from any bondages that hinder our walk with you. Father, grant us the wisdom to live with integrity, as Proverbs 11, 3 teaches, the integrity of the upright shall guide them but the perverseness of transgressors shall destroy them. Help us to be faithful stewards in all that we do, reflecting your love and righteousness. We pray for strength to resist temptation and to stand firm in our faith. Fill us with your Holy Spirit, that we may walk in your ways and fulfill the plans you have for us. Guide us, protect us, and lead us into paths of righteousness for your name's sake. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Thank you for watching. Remain blessed.